Hello, everybody. Today we are going to be talking about another revolution in France and another republic being born. This is the uh, third republic that we're going to get to. Uh, the lecture notes are actually the last couple slides here if you want to go ahead and take a look at them, but you should have the handout to go with it also. So first of all, a little background here. We are at the immediate end of the Franco-Prussian War, so we're going back to the end of the last unit right now. So this is 1871. Uh, the war drives out Napoleon III because he was, you know, captured and defeated. And in its place, a republic was put in. And I say republic uh, because these elections that were forced by Bismarck were focused conservative. He was trying to control defeated France. Um, and remember, at this time, republicanism is still seen as radical and turbulent by most Europeans. Even the French, who had probably had the largest sympathies. And this National Assembly that was created, yes, I know, another confusing name, another National Assembly, but just take my word for it. Only about one-third of the representatives of that assembly were Republican, even though they had much more support in France, and in Paris specifically, I should say. Now, we get to this revolution. It's a civil war. It's a revolution. It's all of these things combined. Essentially, the Paris Republicans, so this group of Parisian radicals, refused to recognize this National Assembly, refused to recognize this government that Metternich, that Metternich, that Bismarck had put into place. They said it was too conservative. And so we have a situation where in Paris there's a civil war. On one side we have the National Assembly, that's the government proper, they are based in Versailles, and then we have the Paris Commune, that's what they call their new government. Uh, they are also referred to as the Paris National Guard. And so this revolution, this civil war, is the Paris Commune, and it lasts from March to May of 1871. Now, the commune, those people on the barricades themselves were mostly workers. They were Republicans, they were patriotic. Um, above all, they were opposed to the bourgeoisie. They were opposed to this aristocracy, this conservativeness. Now, they're not all socialists. I know it's, there should be an all in there. A lot of them were socialists, in fact, but not all of them were. But everybody who was on those barricades were in favor of government regulations of prices, wages, working conditions, basically a lot of the socialist demands that we've talked about in the past. Now, for socialists outside of France, and for Marxists in particular, this commune was being watched. They were thinking, maybe this is the revolution. This is the revolution that overthrows the bourgeoisie, that brings down capitalism and replaces it with socialism. And so in that way, it was feared by the upper classes um, and it was also feared by those in rural France as a return of the radical phase. They're still thinking about that French Revolution of 1789 and the radical phase of it. Now, the war is every war is, and especially civil wars. It was fierce, violent, and it was very personal. It was all in the city. And here you can see just some pictures of the barricades as I'm leafing through them. The cannon on Boulevard Voltaire. Um, you can see the size and scale of some of these. Um, I'm going to have you go back and look at these political cartoons as well and paintings to have you analyze them for what side the artist was on. This is just to kind of give you an idea of the scale of the revolution. Uh, the major, major fighting was in four or five main areas of Paris, um, but this is where it was all going on. Um, so <clears throat> I want you to take a look at these different political cartoons. And remember that they are trying to put in a, a new government and that it is a republic. It is the National Assembly that is in place. So I'm going to give you a second here to look at this political cartoon that says Civil War at the top. This one that's titled Three Thieves. I tell you who the man on the left is. The guy in the center and the guy on the right you should be able to get. And then I want you to look at this one with uh, Marianne and Manning the Cannon. So take a look at those political cartoons, and I'll be back with you in a second. Turns out I never actually went anywhere. I'm still right here. Um, now, as shouldn't be terribly surprising, the National Assembly, the established government, ultimately wins, and they were to eliminate all of their opposition. Uh, 330,000 people were denounced, meaning they were basically persona non grata uh, in this new republic. 38,000 were arrested. Of those 38,000 that were arrested, 
20,000 were eventually executed, and then another 7,500 were exiled or deported. Um, you don't actually say exporting people. That's a little typo there. Um, so the Paris Commune is put down. The revolution is put down. The new government comes in place. But so this third republic, this brand new government, is essentially born in an atmosphere of blood, class hate, and social character. Uh, social terror, excuse me. And so not a great way for a government to start out. So now, this third republic that we're talking about is after the commune. They actually need to rule now. They need to govern. So here's the way that's set up. The monarchs have a majority in the assembly. That was what Bismarck set up. The monarchists do. But they checked each other because basically one branch, one group of monarchists wanted this branch of the monarchy, another branch wanted this branch, and they couldn't agree. And so that National Assembly creates a republic, uh, a two-house parliament with a cabinet. Uh, this passes by one vote out of 600 and only happened because the monarchists wouldn't work with each other. Now, to make a long story short, over a few years, sequence of events establishes parliamentary primacy. So the parliament has the most power, much like we saw happen in England a while back. Um, however, the executive power is in the hands of a president and a cabinet. Their president has more authorities than, for example, the American president does. However, that president and the cabinet are still responsible to the parliament. The parliament still has more power. Now, one of the features of French politics from this point forward is there's always coalition governments. There's so many parties, there's not one party that can dominate all the others. So there's always alliances that keep things moving back and forth. No one party can dominate, so they need to form coalitions. They need to form partnerships with other parties. Um, now, one of the key features is that this government is really trying to centralize everything around them. They don't want regional governments to have a lot of power. So what we call the machinery of the state, stuff like the courts, the police, the army, is very centered on the national government. They want the control. Now, one of the feelings of this government, kind of surrounding it early on, is that it feels very temporary. Because every government from seven, since 1789 has seemed temporary. We went through all those revolutionary governments. We went through um, the Second Republic, the Second Empire. We had this revolution. And so the government doesn't have a ton of support. But then, interestingly, we see a Republican resurgence. Republicanism becomes less of a dirty word in France at this point. Um, basically, kind of how they were oppressed after the commune, the lack of other good options. Republicanism kind of goes through a reputation bump. It gets better. They're less feared and they're more acceptable. That's what I have as the arrow there. Um, and so in 1789, excuse me, misspeak, 1879, the Republicans actually win control of the French Parliament. Now, the conservatives are terrified. They're af afraid of a return of the radical revolution or of socialism or of all kinds of things. They don't know what to do. But the Republicans, when they're in control, they pass some education reform. They pass compulsory education. And that's about as radical as they get. So I think what we see here is the domesticizing of republicanism. Okay, now we're going to talk about the Dreyfus affair, uh, Alfred Dreyfus. This is a very important little side note of our story from the beginning of the Third Republic. Now, you read about him a little bit, but essentially he is a Jewish French military officer who's found guilty of treason. Long story short, he's clearly innocent. His conviction was based on evidence uh, flimsy evidence. There's evidence that he's innocent that was not admitted. Basically, it was a sham trial. Um, now, the military refused to reopen the case. They didn't want to. And this divided the nation because there's a whole group of anti-Semites, royalists, militarists, basically your conservatives who don't want to reopen the case. They don't want to be proven wrong. They don't want to admit that they made a mistake. But there's a lot of supporters, which we call the Dreyfusards. Uh, they wanted justice. And so ultimately, he's pardoned in 1899. I mean, a long story short, he's pardoned. 
But the important part of this story for us is that it showed an undercurrent of anti-Semitism and divisions within France. And this is real important because we haven't talked about anti-Semitism in a while. We haven't talked about it specifically in France for quite some time. But there's this underlying conservative element in France that hasn't gone anywhere, even though the Republicans are a dominant party. And so I think that this is a real important signpost for us along the way in European history and the French to remember that there's still this strong conservative undercurrent. Now, there's a political cartoon here and then an excerpt from an article that highlights uh, Emile Zola's writings about the Dreyfus affair and it just kind of talks a little bit more about it. I want you to read that before we wrap up the lecture.